tenth of a clock. I can understand that people shot one time. But five, six, five, no, I can't understand that. I cannot, it, 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 it goes over my head the reason why this boy was shot so many times. They meant to kill him. They meant to kill him. They were shooting to kill. One bullet I could understand. If one single bullet had killed him, I could almost understand him, not really. But five, six bullets, no. No. And another lady at the community center, she's going to look back and say, is the Malone family worth all of this? A white lady says, is the Malone family worth all of this? Is the Malone family worth all this promotion? And you know what? At this point, it's not about the Malone family. It's about the principle of the matter. How it was done before was shot down in the street like a, a, a rabbit animal. I said, and first of all, why are you here to say something like that? You're not in support of the family if you're here to say something like that. It was a time for it, don't you? We are here to support one another because we don't want this kind of tragedy to continue to go on. First of all, if we're shooting ourselves and killing ourselves, it's okay with the cops. It's okay. That's that double murder that we had down there. It's, it was okay. Exactly. There are other people who are being uh, brutalized by the police officers. Now, I was talking to Mr. McDonald the other day, and if we look at the ratio of, of, of our black people being arrested and being in the paper, as opposed to the ratio of the white people being arrested and being there's no comparison. There's no comparison. So some, we need to get together and find out the ratio of how many white people were arrested for the same things that our black people were arrested for. Our black people put in the paper. The white people weren't put in the paper. They weren't put in the paper. They, they, they're being hidden. We as a black people have always been an oppressed people and it's time for us to come up. They're used to us uh, being in slavery and, and, and sitting back and not saying anything. It's time out for that. It's time out for us being quiet and, and not speaking up and standing up for who we are and who and what we believe in. And right now we want justice. We want justice to avail for this boy being murdered like he was murdered. Thank you.
shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He restoreth my soul. He leads him in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. The obituary. Today is a very solemn occasion. We are gathered together for the homecoming of Christopher Malone. Chris Anthony Malone was born May 13, 1974. He was born in New York, but has been an Ossling resident since 10 months of age. He attended Ossling schools. In 1993, he became a father to a son, Chris Anthony Pitt. Although Chris did not lead an exemplary life, he was not a violent person. He was a loving son, a devoted brother, and a responsible father. He leaves to mourn his mother, Renee Malone, and her devoted loving companion, Ali Sutherland of Ossidy. His son, Christopher Anthony Pitt of New Jersey, two brothers, Charles and Jason Malone of Ossidy, his maternal grandparents, Willie and Willa Mae Malone of the Bronx, New York, his maternal great-grandmother, Ella Lawrence, Bronx, New York, two aunts, Patricia Davis and Anne Maria Brown of the Bronx, one uncle, Andre Malone of the Bronx. He is also survived by a host of aunts, great aunts, uncles, cousins, and friends. My son, I wish I could have been there to wipe away your tears to comfort you and hold you, to ease some of your fear. I never got to say goodbye before you slipped away. I can't describe the hurt and pain I felt on that sad day. You are at rest right now, my dear, but my work has just begun. You cannot speak up for yourself, so I'll speak for you, my son. You are right here in my heart, Chris, forgotten you'll never be. My love for you will never fade, nor will your memory. I love you, Chris, your loving mother. The family would like to express their heartfelt gratitude and sincere appreciation for all the acts of kindness that have been shown. Thank you. Know that we know not the day nor the hour the Son of Man cometh, nor do we know when death is going to occur. So our plans are often interrupted. Sometimes we cannot do what we want to do. So certainly I want you to know that Pastor Luther is with us in prayer at this time. Perhaps to some America's nightmare, but to black America, and most especially to this particular preacher, he is our hero, the Reverend Alfred Shopton. Give an honor to God, to Reverend Luther in his absence, to our friend and brother, Reverend Saul Williams, and all of the clergy, but most importantly to the Malone family and to the friends of Chris that gather today for a day that no one here feels should have happened. We don't know all of the facts, but we do know that this is an occasion that we feel should not have occurred. When I talked with the family last week and then talked to the Westchester DA, and then we all met, I remember in Dobbs Ferry when a young man was killed and that policeman is now in jail. We operated in a sense of 
what we wanted was justice. No matter where the chips fell, let them fall. And that's all this family has said. They're not calling any names. They're not rushing to judgment. They just want justice. And whatever really happened, let the chips fall where they may. But I must say that those that have tried to raise whatever mistakes that Chris made in his life, no matter what someone does, does not give you the right to be the judge and jury over them. This family has said they want peace, and they've asked people to come forward. I would hope the other side also says the same thing, that they want peace and want the police to come forward. It's hard for us to preach to our children to obey the law, and the police won't obey the law. The law must work for everybody. But we do not need to give this mother the burden of her child representing some kind of violence. We should not taint his memory with just aimless anger. We should organize, but we should show our outrage with our dignity. Because to just show outrage and not get justice may vent your feelings, but it will not help him it will not help her, and it will not solve where we need to go. So we don't want violence. We want to stop violence like this. We don't want more bloodshed. We want to stop bloodshed like this. And let me say this to some of the younger people that are understandably shaken because they don't know what this means to them. And you can't condemn them for feeling for their friend. But let me say this to you. You have an opportunity to raise Chris Malone's name to represent not only justice, but represent a new way in your own life. Because I'm going to tell you something. Nobody will respect you unless you respect yourself. Tell me the less fight for respect, and then you go back to the corner selling drugs to one another. <laughs> Don't preach respect and then go out to this church and call our women out their name. Let's have respect all the way around the community. So not only do I challenge you to let's fight whatever is wrong, but let's make a new leaf in his name that we're going to clean up ourselves and clean up those that hurt us. <laughs> Renee, it's going to be dark hours now. It won't be long before the cameras will be gone, the crowds will be gone. You lost your son, no one could ever replace that. Or oh, Ali will be there and some of your family members will be there, but it's going to be some lonely days. We're going to fight to find out what happened. But even in that fight, it will be lonely. The only thing I can tell you, as one that's been in more fights than I want to remember, is in the stillness of the night, always remember there is a God. And he sits high and he looks down low. There's a God for every broken-hearted mother. Sometimes it don't seem like he hears us, but he hears us. My mother raised me by herself. She taught me something that I never forgot. She said he may not be there when you want him, but he's always on time. And if you just believe in him, he'll wipe the tears from your eyes. He'll mend a broken heart. So don't give up. It looked bad today, but don't you give up. Don't get weary. Because God will make it right. He'll give us strength we didn't know we had. I take my seat telling you, you know, my 
My pastor and mentor, Reverend William Jones, was very sick. He's a good friend of Saul Williams. Very sick about two years ago. In fact, he said that he thought he was going to die. He said that he was so sick that he looked up one day in his hospital room. And death appeared at his door. And he looked up, he said he'd been preaching so long, he thought he could talk to death. He started a conversation. He said, death, how long have you been on the job? He said, death didn't answer him. Just kept moving closer to him. He tried again. He said, death, uh, do you ever feel bad about what you do? You've taken loved ones and separated them. You've taken children from their parents and parents from their children. He said, death wouldn't answer him. Just kept moving closer. So he looked up, death was at his bedpost then, and he tried one more time. He said, death, have you ever made a mistake? He said, to his surprise, death stopped. Parted his lips. So you know, I've been out here, Jones, for thousands of years. I took out the first man and woman. I've taken out the rich and the poor, the powerful and the powerless. He said, but I only made one mistake. It was about 2,000 years ago. Monica, he said, it was early one Friday morning. They sent me up a hill called Calvary. And when I got up there, there were three men on the hill. He said, I reached up and I grabbed the one on the right and I took him with me. I reached back and I grabbed the one on the left and I took him with me. Then I came back and I grabbed the one in the middle. Funny thing happened though, when I grabbed the one in the middle, he grabbed me back. And we started wrestling and tussling. For three long days we fought and early that Sunday morning I had to let him go. Renee, don't worry about anything, don't fear anybody. The reason I can keep going is I work for the man in the middle of Calvary. He'll make a way out of no way. He'll sit higher than the Austin police. Just hold on to the man in the middle of Calvary.
under the soil of Christianity, still centered in the minor animalistic views. I've been amused by those fools who choose to try to control why only heritage has my soul, academically designed to incline, defined as a problem, but it's all in the mind. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. The earth gave birth, now has rotted. Plans of a better nation we have plotted, but gluttons push the wrong buttons, causing explosions, mass erosions in the Earth's surface. They have the nerve to get nervous. How dare you say that all men are created equal when poverty, welfare regulates my people, my people, my people, it's time to move mountains, we have nothing to lose. We just stand on the highest plane and yell, mountain move. But brothers hold grudges, cause the mountain never budges. In idleness comes large and motivation is mentally to start. Mmm, the aggravation inside me lingers. Cause all my people know how to do is point fingers. Instead of blaming cells, we blame others. How can you point fingers amongst brothers? I hear swearing, I hear cursing when the real blame is third person, but they say you, they say you, they say you, it has to be you, it can't be I, it must be you, it's you. Why not we? Don't you see? Why not us? We made it unjust. Can somebody tell me how to move a mountain? My people run deep like water flowing from an endless fountain. Don't you understand that we have nothing to lose? We just stand on the highest plane and yell, yo, your mountain move. But leaders don't show faces. Afraid to take their places in the populace. How can you be so bold to give benefits to the old when I have been treated cold before and after? I was 400 years old and sexism does exist. But can I make a list of all my black citizens that had to raise their black fists? My people have been criticized, mutilated, brutalized. How can you speak of sexism and ageism when racism is institutionalized? My people, my people, it's time to move mountains, just nudge them out your path. All lanes, objectives, and goals shall soon be in your grasp. Just follow me, I'll lead the way. Who am I, you might say? Who am I? Who am I? I put hills aside into a landscape I devour. I think critically, analytically, but politically I have power. I can pull clouds out the sky. I can move mountains by the bulk. I swallowed Mount Fuji in one go. Beat Mount Kenya to a pulp. I grinded the rocky till it tasted like syrup. Leaped over the Appalachians towards my travels into Europe. Mercy, mercy, even as they speak. You know they cry in mercy upon communism peak Even when I The cool breeze across seas You bring the Alps to my knees And still stop off in Vienna To take the chocolate and cheese There is no peace in Greece for the gods that run a host I capsize Mount Olympus and wrestle Zeus for his lightning bolt. My people cry victory, but I have more in store. For I go back to the United States and sizzle my face in Mount Rushmore. And as I leave South Dakota, I want all my people to follow. For I travel to the motherland to be drums on Kilimanjaro. I pass by the pyramids, but I left them alone. They're no geometrical equation, but the said black old. My people cry victory, victory. I see no victory today. For Mount Everest still stands to be my finest prey. And so I climb Mr. Everest and I look at my two eyes. And said no longer would your head remain above the clouds in the sky. I came down and told my people Mount Everest must fall. One half in the back. The other half in Nepal, my people just laughed and others seemed uncertain. And again in time of struggle and action, they questioned my person. I said maybe they don't know who I am. Who am I? And what I can do? Who am I? And what I can do? Who am I? And what I can do? I can goggle bodies of water by the gallons and cases. Spit them into the spaces to form an oasis. 
I can make the leaning tower be the stand firm and tall. Make the Statue of Liberty have a very bad fall. Yes, I am black and a black man's epitome. I can take Sicily off the boot of Italy. All mountains shall shake from the power that I create. People in California would swear it was an earthquake. So please, Mr. Everest, let me spare you today. I said mountain. Move out of my way. <laughs> ago what the results were going to be yes, he did. Yes, he did. and 
and not only did he tell me what the results was going to be, he told me how it was going to happen. So if I want to tell me something, I got to believe it, okay? Now he told me what was going to happen. And I say, well, what we'll do is we'll go out and we'll give the DA enough rope to hang himself. In other words, we're going to testify and we're going to tell them what we know. Now it's up to them to take that stuff and put it together and come up with an indictment. Uh, they didn't do that. Uh, one thing they said to us was that we didn't come out as a community and then we didn't, we didn't give the testimony the way we said we were going to do it. So uh, all, even though we all agreed to come together and work together, we've agreed that each organization was going to be doing what they do, you know, and, and had been doing. So one thing that I'm going to be committed to doing in my organization, if the board agree, is to nitpick, quick look, long time wait on what was presented to the grand jury, what in what fashion, and who said what, because we didn't get those answers when we went there. So uh, uh, I want to see criminal indictments. What we are talking about with Walter is getting injunctions against the police department. I'm fast person that believes that I want a person that makes, commits a crime, indicted, and prosecuted. So even though we're going to be working on one end, I want to be working too on how can we get a reconvene a grand jury and get these guys re uh, submitted for indictment. So with that, I want to, oh, let me, before I go, they're passing out leaflets for the organization that Walter brought in. Uh, okay, booklets. So if I think we have a few. If somebody wants to look at it while we're going through the meeting, we'll pass it around, make sure you get it back to us because we don't have that many. But this booklet kind of tells you what the organization is about that uh, fights for your right. You, she's going to speak to you, and you can ask her some questions if you want. So uh, that being said, I'm going to go to George Douglas. I represent quite a few um, organizations up here. Um, I sit on the police advisory committee. Um, one of the things I want to do when, when we meet the police advisory committee meet is um, talk about the mayor, the chief of police, and the village board member that sits on that board to please step down and remove yourself. Um, I, you know, I don't know how the rest of the people feel, but that's what I'm going to ask them to do. Um, not like Jerry and, and, and Walter, I remember meeting with Janine in the office, and I remember saying that I don't think Chris' investigation would be fair. Because of the connection between the Austin police and the district attorney's office, um, if we go back um, in history and remember Tom, Tom Redden, who was taped calling his fellow officer a nigger, that was never investigated by the district attorney's office. So I don't see why the people in this community would think Chris would have got a fair investigation, being that he was um, a young black man and shot down by three police officers, executed by three police officers. Um, I don't think we, we even should have took it in consideration that he would have got a fair trial. Um, so many questions need to be asked. Um, this morning, a young lady came to me and she said, George, they, they, they never called my niece to the grand jury. Said what she had to say was very important. And I asked her, what, what did our niece have to say? And she said, well, when she arrived right after the shooting, that um, Officer Slater was kneeled down in his car praying, what, oh Lord, what have I done? What have I done? And these are things that the grand jury didn't hear. See, the majority of the witness that was um, brought to the grand jury was the things that they wanted the grand jury to hear. And the things they didn't want them to hear, they didn't ask these witnesses to come forward. Um, so, and, and I, I talked to 12 people that, was, that went to the grand jury, and the thing that I couldn't understand is that each one, except for one, one, one person, 
Each one of them said um, the people that was in the grand jury was um, two, two blacks and 19 white, and then it was one black and 19 white. So um, I'm, I'm saying the grand jury itself would seem to be um, unbalanced with, with, you know, with people. And, and I called Philip Banks and I asked him how was the grand jury picked? But he's the lead investigation from investigator from the um, DA's office, and he told me he would get back to me, and this never happened. So, uh, you, you know, we got to look at it that this was all planned by the grand jury. That I knew when I first walked in Jenny's office that it wouldn't be um, this man wouldn't get a fair investigation. You know, and especially when they gave the police, the chief of police here, and with the mayor being the mayor had the, had the right to ask the chief um, right after this happened to get reports from these police officers and, and, and they had time to make their story and to sit down and, and, and get together with each other and to tell what they were gonna tell to, to, the, to the grand jury. They had enough time to do this. And right to today, we haven't, we haven't seen a report or anything. So we, we, we knew what to expect. My name is Charlie Knight and I am a member of the NAACP and also OPSIC. I was um, in the district attorney's office yesterday. I think we were there for, they say four hours. I, I came late, so I was there for three hours. But I just wanted to share with you that we as a people, we need to get our thing together. If you're out here telling me certain things, and I'm saying, I want to say this to, to everybody because I want you to hear me because I'm, I am a person, I am a fighter, and I do not roll over. I do not roll over, and I think the school board and any other organization in Austin can attest to that. So if you tell me one thing, and I'm fighting for that, please, if you have to go before a grand jury or anybody, be willing to say the same thing. Because when I was in the grand jury's office yesterday, what I heard was the witnesses that came forward, some of them said, yes, we said such and such a thing, but once they put the hand on the Bible and took an oath, they had a different story, okay? And I, don't, I, I think if, we, if, in all fairness, if you're asking me, and me as an African American, who feel that you know our children are very bright, I feel we are bright people, but we got to be fair with each other. We got to tell the truth, and we have to be willing to go forward. The other thing I said to ev to, to everybody I talked to is the evidence that was presented to me. I didn't see anything. I didn't read any report. Okay, I didn't read any material whatsoever. But what they presented to us, okay, they had they put a gun in Chris King. They have evidence, they say, to back that up. They said that the, um, the gun they found at the scene, the bullet they took from the interfaith window matches. And they claim they have ballistic testing to attest to that. Okay, I don't know, I'm, 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 I'm no expert in that field. And I cannot tell you whether that can be covered up or not. But I have to be smart enough in my mind to think that that office have to know that somebody is watching over them or, or there can be a federal investigation. So if they're going to cover up, they're going to cover up good. That they're not gonna let us pick it apart like that. I mean, we sat there and we tried. We tried, what, uh, Jerry tried, I mean, I think at some point they wanted to throw uh, Jerry and Coca out of there. Because, I mean, they kept digging and digging and digging and digging, you know, to, to find holes in whatever they said to us. You know, uh, I did find some discrepancy with the 911 tape. I would like to hear that. I'm told, you know, that we, we can't hear that tape. You know, when I heard, the first time I heard about the 911 tape, I was under the impression the 911 caller was given an account, an account of things as they happened, okay? And it, it just, in my mind, that if she was doing that, and if he shot off a 40 caliber weapon, you would have to have heard that gunshot in that tape, okay? Then they said, well, no, she called after the fact. So I don't know. And I'm told we can't hear the tape. But I'm, I'm telling you, 
that if you're asking, and, and I know Walter, I respect Walter, Walter has been in this fight for a long time, much longer than I have, so I'm not gonna sit here and say what he's saying is not true, okay? But I'm saying that I am a fighter, and I will go forward, but if I'm to go forward, you have to go with me. You have to be honest. You cannot have me go and calling anybody anything and I find out that it's not true and I look like a fool. Now I want everybody to know that, okay? And again, like I said, everything in my opinion, in my opinion, that they presented to us, that they put a gun in his hand. Okay, when I say that, I'm saying they have the evidence to back up that he had a gun. You know, people told me he didn't have a gun. I, they, huh? They say they have the evidence. They, right, they say they have the evidence. I'm saying to you, I didn't see them, but what they said to us, okay? They said they have the scientific, um, scientifically they can back up the fact that when they shot him, he was in a standing position. I was told he was down when they shot him, okay? Huh? I was told by the district attorney's office. Everything, when I say they say, I mean the district attorney's office, okay? So all I'm saying to you is if there, if there were witnesses who saw what happened, they should have went forward, can they still go forward? I don't know. But I'm telling you, as far as what the DA's office told us is that those witnesses came, they had a different story. Okay, that's all I'm saying. So I, I'm asking and pleading again. You know, I am one who will fight. I'm not afraid. But you have to level with me. You have to tell me the truth. Don't have me fighting something and I find out it's a whole different story. You know, so I, I, I thought it was important for you to know that. Okay, um, I just want to introduce the lawyer who came up through and give us some advice so she can touch on a few points because she does have to get out of here soon. Um, this is Barbara Oshansky from the um, Center for Constitutional Rights. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I thought I um, would go through um, a few of the steps that the center is taking now and maybe um, enlist your suggestions for other things that we could do uh, to tell you where what we're trying to get underway. Um, first, uh, Bill Goodman, the legal director, asked me to convey to everyone that um, we are willing to um, represent anyone and to work with anyone else who's representing someone who wishes to um, come forward as a witness and appear before any grand jury should one be opened or should a federal one um, be called for. And so, and we'll and we're we'll be up here and we'll explain to you what those grand jury proceedings are and, and work through the whole process. So. Um, please, if anyone's you know interested in learning more about that or talking to us, feel feel free to contact us, and um, that's something that we'll we'll always be available for during this whole process. Um, the the second thing that um, uh, Kamani, another staff lawyer that I work with, and Bill and I have talked about, um, is for, for a, a longer term view and some very um, affirmative. Uh, action that we want to take is to look at uh, the history of the police department in Ossining, which I, having lived here, <laughs> am intimately familiar with, um, for you know corruption and civil rights violations and discrimination in hiring. So the police you know, force stays the same and looks the same for 20 and 30 years here. Um, and in that line, one of the things that Kamani's been working on is freedom of information law requests. And it's not only towards that lawsuit, but also at looking for what the information that you know, Jerry was talking about that's happened here. Getting copies of the medical examiner's reports and the ballistics reports and uh, accounts by the police officers and anything that's, that's been documented that they're using as a basis for whatever determination they made. And we're sending those out this week and we're gonna follow that up very diligently to make sure that we get everything possible that we can see to say what they're, they've like based their decisions on. Um, some other suggestions that um, we, we were thinking about um, that you all might want to discuss um, are, and we did this recently on um, police brutality and police misconduct in New York City, 
we, we worked with uh, John Kiner's office um, to set up a, a public community hearing on uh, community and police interaction. And it worked, it was a very effective process. People from all over New York City testified, and a number of members of the Congressional Black Caucus were there and could take the, the complaints and the issues back with them to Congress to get an oversight committee started to look at this particular issue. And I think that's a very effective way of doing things. And I know just from sitting here and listening to everyone talk, I, like, I, I just could take down like six incidents that happened, I don't know, probably within the last year or so that you're all talking about. And that kind of thing is very effective for uh, uh, congressmen to hear. And so that's something that you might want to think about. Um, and that we can help facilitate really easily. And along those lines, our, one of our connections with John Conyers is our executive director, whose um, his name is Ron Daniels. I don't know if people are familiar with Ron Daniels, but he's been working at the center for about four or five years and um, came to us from uh, running the Rainbow Coalition for Jesse Jackson. And he's great. He has a lot of connections with um, Conyers' office and people in the Congressional Black Caucus and is willing to use you know, all of his clout, whatever it is, to, um, to pull something together for us. And he would like to come to um, one of the next meetings that you're holding to talk with you about what you would like to see happen. Um, and, and the last thing, and by no means the least, is uh, we would like to arrange a meeting with um, Mary Jo White, the US Attorney for the Southern District of New York. And I think um, really the only way to do it is to have uh, people from the community come with us to that meeting and to, to say what they know and what they think, and to, to call personally for um, a federal grand jury. And we're going to be working on that on Monday. And you know what we would really encourage people to do is that people that want to participate is to call and let us know, because your voice is much more important than ours when we go down there. Um, they see our faces all the time in court. and. Anyway, so those are some of the things that we've been thinking about, and I, I would love if anyone has suggestions about other things we should look into or things that you think we should be thinking about, please tell me. Um, yeah. The federal grand jury would specifically be about this case as opposed to the grand jury. So, so people who you want to hear from or people who like Yeah, I mean, I think that it could probably serve two purposes. I think we, we're right now talking about a, 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 a committee of grand jury on this particular case. But I think, given the history of this police department in Osamie, it's, it's very helpful for them to hear about what the, the, the relations are generally. And I think one thing that we've been talking about as an ultimate goal is um, doing something permanent to this police department, like something that we're, it's going to mean permanent oversight in mm -hmm. some way. So I think that's, that is probably part of, part of the agenda, too. Can I ask about that? I'm, um, you know, um, the police department, as far as I know now, is 52 or 53 members, one of whom is African American. And, and uh, I think actually, uh, oddly enough, the, the statistics uh, in terms of representation of at least the African American population have decreased over time in an environment where you think the opposite would have been um, to be expected. Um, Talking to uh, um, officials about that, both the chief of police and, and other government representatives, they they um, they you know they, they throw up their hands and say they've tried so hard to have things work the other way, uh, but but it, it's sort of a, a law of, of uh, not really a law of nature, but somehow written in stone that there's absolutely nothing they could possibly have done. To have, you know, and I don't know um, quite what to make of that. You know, I mean, it's repeated uh, again and again um, as, well, there's this list and, and there are simply not African Americans on the list and there's nothing we can do about it and we so much want to have a different situation, but that's just the way it is. So. Well, um, you know, there's been, a, a part of what I've done is, um, in, in my work, is done employment discrimination work. And what the, the balance of this population, the police department looks like compared to what Osman looks like is, you know, that's nuts. And so the question is, you know, should that be part of a federal investigation hiring procedures? And I, I think that it should be because I think this problem is, ver is very much because of what that police department looks like. And um, 
So I think that's something that we would tell them that we would really specifically want to look at is, you know, what, are, what is this list? Who gets on that list? Why aren't civil service exams available to anybody? Why can't anyone go through, you know, you know, training and, you know, get, get on this force? And, you know, I think there's probably, that's probably one of a number of things that people would want to have them look into. Um, there's a woman back there and often, yeah. Um, I mean, my understanding is that there's been no, no penalties and no punishment at all, and what, that. What as, uh, what as people that live in the community where, where, the, where the racist police do patrol 24 hours a day? How are we to protect our children and, and ourselves from these kind of murderers? You know, well, well, they, well, one thing I would recommend that people do is that you know, especially now, but I think all the time is. I know it's a, it's like a, it's an imposition, but it's really effective. And it, and I, I talked to in Pittsburgh, the, the a police department there was put under receivership because of corruption and and racist practices. And one of the things that they did in the community is um, after an incident similar to this, everybody on based on every interaction kept a log of like you know all kinds of pardon the words. But fucked up interactions with the police. And whenever it happens, you write it down. And so, and you write it down right then, so that there is something that, like, a, that's a contemporaneous record of what goes on. That's like something where, you know, from where they tell you to leave a bar early to anything that's problematic. Why are you sitting in your car? You know, following you home from the, from the train station? You know, like, why are you walking? You know, whatever, I mean, whatever's going on, not that that's protection, um, but that it will really be helpful in showing what kind of relationship there is with the community here. Did, did, did anybody like from um, law enforcement take a look at that, you know, putting these police officers back out there might be a danger no. to the self as well as us, uh, you know, people out in the community? You know, because there's a lot of people that really, you know, want to, you know, go crazy, but they don't because, you know, they don't want problems and, you know, they have families and children like that. You know, but that's not going to be good because once a lot of people start seeing their faces down there, it's going to stir up a lot of, you know, emotional shit. Excuse my expression, but that's what's going to happen, you know? My name is Nancy Holbrook. My name is Nancy Holbrook, and I'm the secretary of OPSIC. And on yesterday, I had an opportunity to speak to, with one of the sergeants, and I voiced my concern that these officers would be allowed to patrol our streets again. Now, I understand that they've been acquitted. However, they need to be moved to another location yes. because there's going to be a lot of tension in this village. And what he said to me, well, what about the tension that the police will experience? Well, I, I, I sympathize and empathize with the police, but I also am concerned about our community. The right thing to do would be to put them in Briarcliff, Croton, Tarrytown. But to bring them back to Othing would be an atrocity because of the effect that they will have on our community. And then our young people and anyone that comes in contact with any of these officers will always be ready for them. Yeah, that's right. Right. And there's going to be a problem, and that's something that Tom Cambieri, who decided that he would come here today, although I asked him not to, should that's consider. Right. Okay, let me just say this. We uh, we did talk, I talked to the police chief about possibly not putting the officers back in the community, and he felt that because of uh, the amount of police officers that was off and the, and the amount of policemen that he didn't have, he just couldn't afford not to put these policemen someplace else. So his attitude is that the uh, safety of the public comes second, and the village finances come first. That's right. Oh, boy. That's right. And we have to do something not to allow them back on these streets because I have three sons and you all have family members and they can shoot any one of our children. Okay. Oh, we're gonna we're gonna have to raise our hand and wait to be called on. I I talked to the chief about um, the police officers coming back down in the community because a young lady called me and said that she seen one of the officers involved in the execution laugh right through the community smiling. I'm like, it was all right. 
and he told me it wasn't anything he could do about it. I think the best thing for the community to do is, you know, not allow these policemen in their community. And by any means, that's necessary. That's the way I feel. My name is uh, Thomas Knight, and I'm here representing um, Police Community uh, Relations Board, uh, also uh, NAACP and OPSIC. And I just want to say, I was at the uh, district attorney's office yesterday, and I went there not knowing what to expect. And I left there, I have to say, still less informed because of the fact that what I got out of it was that the district attorney says that due to scientific evidence that was presented and the, uh, the testimony of the witnesses, and the witnesses uh, consist of uh, police officers as well as uh, uh, people from the community that came forward, uh, the grand jury found the uh, officers uh, innocent of uh, any uh, type of wrongdoing. But this is what's presented to me verbally, and I was not there in the presence of uh, having any, uh, any type of uh, reports presented to us or any uh, written uh, forms or statements verbally uh, recorded or anything from the uh, grand jury. And the way it operates is that the witnesses go into the grand jury room, give their testimony, they come out, and they're allowed to say what took place in there, but the district attorney and the lawyers there can't can't say anything, so I'm left with what they say. So now I leave out of there and say, well, where do we go from here? Well, you have uh, an opportunity to uh, requ uh, request a federal investigation. Uh, we can demand of the, uh, the trustees, the mayor, that uh, we start seeing a, a, a better reflection of our community on the police force. That's, that's steps that we can take positive, non-violent steps that we can take. We can demand these things, not ask to demand them. Okay, and I, and I say demand it because it's been too long that this community has gone without a true reflection of the community on that police force. Uh, over time, well, I did a little research in the, uh, in the law of Westchester County, 5711Q, and the mayor is here and uh, Ernest is here, and they can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, it's my understanding that uh, possibly we can hire uh, police officers on a temporary basis. And if you do that, that would uh, maybe help eliminate some of the overtime that has been incurred. And also that would uh, lead towards getting a better reflection of what we need on the police force to reflect what we have in this community. Francine Vernon. Um, I'm here representing the Police Community Advisory Committee. I'm also with the Community Action Program and a longtime resident of Osmond and a concerned resident of Osmond. Um, a very short notice, you had good representation from those of us who had an opportunity to go down and go over some things with the district attorney. It's unfortunate that that kind of briefing could not be expanded and given to the total community. But I want you to know that those that were there, diverse, spoke up, pushed questions, and tried to anticipate the kinds of questions and concerns that the community was going to have, and tried to get answers. Um, for some of us, it was a learning process. I don't know how many of you have experienced um, grand juries and procedures of investigations, but most of the people there had not. And so we learned some things. One of the things that we learned, to repeat what um, Tom just said, is that there's very little information that can be publicly given um, about what went on in the grand jury room. So while they were able to review with us the time element as they saw it, they were not able to answer some of the questions that we had about what we thought were inconsistencies. They were able to tell us the number of people that were um, subpoenaed to the grand jury and the number that appeared. 
and they assured us, contrary to the impression that some people had speaking directly with people who had testified at the grand jury, that the same people heard all of the witnesses. That question was asked repeatedly, and they insisted that the number was consistent, and the same people heard all of the testimony. So I think that that's something that can be validated from the attendance records from the grand jury, should that be requested at some other future attempt. Charlie Knight mentioned that they were questioned about the discrepancies between what was being said in the community, about whether this young man had a weapon in his hand or didn't have a weapon in his hand. And they insisted that there was a combination of not only witnesses, but also backed up by their scientific evidence to establish that he did have a weapon and that he had fired a weapon. Standing or not standing was the other issue that we kept hammering away at because we had heard, and perhaps through the media have a different impression of what happens when someone is shot, is, well, why was he shot so often? Why did they need to have that many rounds discharged? And it was explained by those who use firearms regularly that it doesn't take long for automatics to discharge a lot of bullets. And that he was standing, and when he fell, he still had the gun in his hand, and it was not until, I guess, the impact of his wounds took over that the gun fell from his hands right in the position where he was standing. Now, they claimed that that was validated scientifically as well as by people who were witnesses. So we questioned on some things. There are questions that we couldn't get answers to, but I do think that the DA's office generously spent a lot of time, as I understand it, with the family. I understand that they were given a lot more information, which is right. And then they spent a lot of time until yesterday evening with those of us from the community. And they had a wide range of people who had been involved with the investigation and answered what they thought they legally could answer to us. Now, true or not true, I think it's the next steps that a combination of groups and people might decide to do that will be able to validate the information that was given out. I have to compliment the community for bringing together a panel. This is a group of people representing diverse opinions and backgrounds, but it shows the unity in the community to stand together to make our community better. And it's a sensible way to proceed. And anyone who has any influence on others in the community should encourage them to move forward peacefully, but sensibly and determined that there will be a change. And that we don't have these kind of incidents, that we are not characterized by the lack of quality in any part of our community life, but definitely in those that we entrust to protect us. And I think by having legal representation, it is wise. We have historians in the struggle. Let the courts determine if what we as citizens believe has not been exactly correct. I think the history will speak for itself. And we have to encourage people to let the process take place and be as patient as they can, but determined to keep it going. And I believe you have the support of the Community Relations Committee to help out in that way in any way that they can. I was on, I went to the grand jury as a witness. I went to the grand jury as a witness. And I know for a fact that it was bogus because they only asked certain questions. They asked what they wanted to hear and they wouldn't let you speak. At the same time, it wasn't 59 people who went over there. Because when I got there, 16 people were already missing. 16 people did not show up. So 59 people was not 
well, it's not the number that um that finalized the um the grand jury hearings. It was less than fifty nine. All right, and um like I said, they only asked certain questions for what they wanted to hear. They would not let you speak to tell your story. They only asked certain questions. I only stood in there twenty minutes, and what I saw, I should have been in there a lot longer. One thing we're asking is that um, anybody that uh, testified before the grand jury, because I have a question of whether or not the same grand jury sit in on all the questioning. So I will ask that anybody that testified before the grand jury could contact somebody on one of the committees so we could try to assess how many people was there, who was there, and if it was a difference in the people that they were presenting the testimony to because we've been assured that the only people that made the determination were the people that listened to all the testimony. So if, if that was untrue, I think that that would be some kind of uh, indictment that uh, the federal uh, prosecutors Phil, could Phil go Phil Banks took me in his office and he told me that um, there's, there's been a change in Austin and they're not getting the same stories and people are not showing up. And he told me that whichever way it goes down, I want you to behave yourself. So he was already telling me that they were not going to be indicted. Right. You know what I'm saying? He was already telling me in his office. It was just me and him in there. When did that occur? That happened on um, September 11th. Okay. All right? They had me over there at 9 o'clock. I didn't get into the grand jury till 2.30. With whom? Philip Banks. Philip Banks. The lead investigator. It was it was um Philip Banks, and then there was another gentleman. I don't, I don't recall his name. When that gentleman left, Philip Banks asked me, what's going on in Austin? Um, we got one story when we were doing all this invest investigation, but people coming over here, they're changing their story. And however it goes down, Mr. Mars, I want you to behave yourself because you're a nice man. So he was telling me, you know what I'm saying, that they weren't going to get indicted. And this was a week ago. But that was Wait, based how on did they change this story? Why did they change this story? I don't know. Oh, I don't know. I don't oh, know. We don't want to get to the thing. That's what they said. That's what they said. I don't know why they changed the story. It's, it's one problem we got over there is that, is that they didn't they didn't answer the questions that we felt necessary to know in order to come back and justify to the community. It's not that they were changing their stories, they were only asking certain right. questions. Right. You know what I'm saying? So they taking it as they changing their story. Uh -huh. you know what I'm saying? And then people didn't come forward. The grand jury's findings on this investigation, when is it going to be released if it already has and if it already has? Uh, what they said to us was all of these statements, uh, they have already released the statements or the finding of the grand jury to the press. It will be no information about the grand jury release. They made it clear to us that all that is confidential and they couldn't release it. And what was, wait, and, wait. And what was, the, what was the makeup of the grand jury in terms of its race and geographical location? They didn't give that to us. It was two blacks on there. And everybody was over 50 years old. Well, see, the problem we had was that some of the people went in said it was five blacks, some said it was two, some said it was one. So, the guy in the middle of the head I don't think Ernest was finished. I mean, um, Arnell blocked the front. Yeah, man. Do you have a question or comment? Yeah. Yeah, in terms of what they're going to release. I understand that they can't release any details of what happens in that inside the, the testimony and all, but are they forced to release one I have two questions, two things. Are they forced to release the police reports? Aren't the police reports generally public record? And second of all, are they forced to release any sort of sequence of events? It sounds like they have released a decision, but do they also have to release a sequence of events? I realize the police report itself will have a sequence of events, but the findings should have a sequence of events which would be either consistent with or not consistent with the police report and consistent with or not consistent with the witnesses that we've heard from in the community. My understanding is that anything that comes <clears throat> as part of the deliberative process of the grand jury or comes out of the grand jury is in, in the form of findings will not be released. We'll, we'll, we won't see anything from them. But we, we, we will request, and we are entitled to um, reports and, and records from the police department, um, with the exception of certain um, items which in New York are deemed confidential, and we've had a lot of difficulty getting, even in, in these types of cases. Um, we do have a case pending in the city 
uh, in which it, it does seem like you, we might get some of those records, which are sort of independent records that the officers have to write immediately after they're participating in an incident. Um, but we'll get, we'll get things like the ballistics records and all of those other police records, but we won't have access to anything that um, came out of the grand jury. To me, what, what, what is important in, in the entire event, uh, well, among other things, uh, but one thing that's important is uh, whether or not he had a gun when he was shot. Um, and it's, it's unclear to me from the description of the discussions about the uh, grand jury proceedings whether anyone but the policemen themselves claimed that he had a gun. Now, is, is that itself a secret? You know, whether or not the, the policemen's reports were corroborated by any other independent, in other words, whether anyone except the people accused of shooting him without a gun saw him with a gun. Right, that's right. Um, someone came to me that was at the grand jury and said that they told the grand jury when they approached the scene um, that police officer Slater had a gun in the middle of his back and over at the DA's office, they told someone that was there that this was a gun. You know, my thing is, is why was this police officer walking around with this gun in the middle of his back after this man had already been executed? And he said, with blood on the gun. Um, and they said that Chris had never been, sh his hand was never, um, he wasn't shot in his hands. Um, we know that the man who buried Chris stated at a meeting we was at that he was shot through the hand wow. while he was up. Ex -police officer, right. This was an ex-police officer. And he, he found the bullet over here. So we know that he was shot in the hand. And if that, and, and Tom, Tom made, um, Tom said, said this to me, if, if that police officer, if it was blood on that gun, why the police officer had this gun in, in his back. Why wasn't um, the policeman's um, shirt or pants brought into the grand jury? We don't know that. Well, I mean, it's a question that should, should have been asked. That's what I'm saying. And also, um, they were asked directly whether the witnesses were um, citizens or police officers, and they said they could not answer that. So that's why I was going to let you know that. That's what they said. Yeah, that's what they said. Repeat the question again, Ralph. Yeah, my, my question is, um, um, does it create the, the uh, does, is, is it, is it uh, against the rules, whatever, you know, the rules uh, to, to give, make public evidence in a, in a place, yeah? Yeah, the, the um, grand jury uh, proceeding is supposed to be a, a secret deliber deliberative process, investigatory process, and so um, they won't release anything that was stated in, in there. I mean, you know, the, the, that doesn't mean that there aren't a lot of ways to find out the events as they happened or what the police officer's testimony was and what kind of records were kept. Um, after the events. I mean, I, we know that the police officers were permitted to go home and immediately afterwards. I don't know, that the, but I don't know whether they had to write anything down before at all or whether they had to report after that time. And so there are other records that are required to be kept that we're, we're going to try and get access to that might give us some of the information that was, you know, discussed in the grand jury proceeding. Ernest McFadden, uh, village trustee, um, here also today as a, a private citizen. Um, I think you, you were well represented in terms of going yesterday and hearing a briefing. Um, the briefing ended up being a four and a half hour um, us asking questions of them and being very frustrated not being able to get any answers. Um, I at one point mentioned to the district attorney that as a, a community representative in terms of sitting on the board and the members that was in the audience, 
Uh, we ought to be able to go back to our community with some, sp some specific details that we can share with, with the community. Uh, and I think everyone will attest that. I mean, it was so frustrating, and, and I will support what Charlie had said, that uh, at one point, Jerry and, and Charlie Coke, I thought they were going to be escorted out. Because, I mean, it was just, I mean, it's almost, you're asking a question, what seems to be a relatively simple question, and you can't get an answer. I mean, the question that I had raised was, uh, how many rounds were fired? Uh, not the amount of times he were hit. Uh, and I got the maximum was, and that quite that, that didn't quite sit well uh, if, if all the weapons were checked. I think certainly, uh, as Francine had said, I, I, I commend and, 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 and pleased to see the unity that we have here today. Um, seeking legal advice in terms of where do we proceed from here. Um, I, however, will preference that that being relatively new on the board, um, the issues that we're dealing with here in Osning, obviously is not unique to Osning. We hear the same uh, stories in New York City and all around the country. And I will certainly support any uh, activity that, 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 that we're trying to come up with something constructive, one, to make our community whole. And if it means uh, um, uh, identifying bad offices in our department, uh, then certainly we need to do that. And I think we have the, uh, the legal, I think the direction that you're taking now in terms of seeking legal advice is the way to go. Um, but certainly make no mistake about it, and I think everyone has said it, you know, uh, let's not cast the, the, the blanket on the entire department as opposed to the individual that we may, that we may be naming um, in, 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 these, in the incident. So, so certainly I uh, support what, what's going on here today. Uh, as a private citizen, I'm concerned. Uh, I have a one-year-old. I have brothers, a uh, brother that's, that, 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 uh, that's in this community. Uh, and I'm concerned, and certainly we ought to be able to walk around the community uh, and, and feel safe. Uh, so. Were you supporting um, what they were doing the whole time? What's changed now for you to come out and say that you're um, with them at, at, from what they're doing now? It's been a peaceful battle the whole way. I'm sorry. I'm saying nothing's changed. It's, they always, it always has been calm and hasn't been violent. Mm -hmm. What's different now that you're supporting what's going on today? Well, I think one of the things we have, that, that has came about in terms of allowing the, 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 the criminal justice system in terms of to take its course, I think um, we, and certainly understanding my position, not uh, wanting to rush to judge to any judgment, and in terms of allowing the, the, the uh, district attorney and, and her office and, and ultimately being passed on to the grand jury, um, I have always been wanting to remain neutral and having an open uh, mind in terms of what's, what the outcome is going to be. Jimmy, just two more questions. One, what's the status of the state and federal investigation on this situation? Now, could anybody let me know what's happening with that? The state and federal investigation. If I'm not mistaken, this one was the state investigation, if I'm not mistaken. And the federal is, um, I'm not sure if they come on that. Um, at this point, there there is no federal investigation. I think there's been some discussion um, in the U.S. Attorney's Office, but only that, only that, nothing more, which is why, um, I don't know if you were here in the beginning, we talked about um, convening a meeting with the um, U.S. Attorney's Office and going down there with individuals from the community to talk about what we, you know, the community would like to see happen. Wasn't there some involvement from the FBI? And, the yeah. the FBI and one more question. Um, since some of the members of the advisory board are here right now, is it, I don't know if you mentioned it in the beginning or during the time that I had missed it, is there going to be an emergency meeting tomorrow? of the uh, community Police Community Relations Board. It's a Tuesday. It's a Tuesday? I thought an emergency meeting was called for tomorrow. Two o'clock in the library. Two o'clock in the library? When? Tomorrow. Uh, I wouldn't call it necessarily an emergency meeting. They'll it's not. It's not restricted. 
The purpose of the meeting is to make sure that other members of the advisory committee who are not at the briefing have an opportunity to know what went on at the briefing. And so a meeting is being called in preparation for our regular meeting, which is on the 28th. So we will be giving a report to the members of our advisory committee who are not present at the DA's office. And that's the purpose of tomorrow's meeting. What I said is, it's not closed. It really is just to update everyone about what went on at the DA's office so that when we have our regular meeting, our advisory members are all knowledgeable. So if I come in person and walk the street and I can't sit in, that wouldn't be a problem? It would not be a problem. Okay. You can't go. Right. Yeah. I didn't hear about the advisory press conference with Jeanine Pirro. Of course, Jeanine Pirro had me in jail yesterday, even though I have a tape of an incident that they used trickery to keep out. And the newspaper refused a tape of an incident that proves two Briarcliff cops and a guy named Angelo Boccaccio are perjurers. I have a question to you, Ernest. If you're so interested, how come I was threatened to be arrested at the last Austin Village board meeting I went to when I addressed police brutality incidents? Okay? In other words, your police chief came over and threatened to arrest me while I was talking about police brutality and incidents of criminal activity by friends of the police department. The third question before Ernest Palavras is that the state and federal investigation is over because the FBI has said that the Austin police did the right thing for at least three weeks. Okay? So it was all a charade. It's always a charade. And I'm sick and tired just before an election of people pretending that they care when I have been brutalized and people in the community by the Austin police and criminal friends of theirs. And I have tape of a village board meeting, Ernest, where a guy said, excuse me, am I going to be allowed to speak? No, because we did not come here to talk about what and what Ernest has not done. Right. We're here for other reasons. Well, in other words, I can't ask a question. Not about Ernest and not about what he's doing. I'm asking about the village board. This meeting is for us, the African American community, to see where we are going from here. In other words, the only people that are victims. That's not true. That's not true. That's not what I'm saying. We came here today to see how are we going to move forward. We can't discuss what, no. We can't discuss what Ernest has and has not done. No. 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 Clay, Clay, we're letting you ask your question. We're letting you ask your question. Thank you. We let you ask your question. Ernest is going to answer your question. Thank you. Okay, first of all, in terms of that, the village, at, at the village board, when you, you're, according to your statement that you was arrested, I did not observe that. And if you, and you have, a, and you, I did not, I did not observe it. And you have the right, just as everyone else do, to file a complaint. With who? The, the Austin police? The people that are that are perpetrating the criminal activity? You asked me, a, you asked me a question and I'm responding. You that's who, see that's it? who you were following? No, you I did not. See it. I did not observe it, no. Were you at that meeting? I believe I may have been at that meeting, but... You didn't, want, you didn't see that the police chief stepped in front of me and I said, what are you going to do, arrest me? And he says, if it comes to that. And then he looked over at uh, Cambieri and then Cambieri looked over at Barnes and Barnes probably realized that even in Austin, you can't arrest somebody for asking questions. I, and I'm sick and tired of you pretending you don't see anything. I, I did Ignorance not... is never random. You ask it. You ask the question. I responded. If you have a complaint, you have the right to file a complaint. But I. But I'm just telling the audience out there because I think the police brutality includes the uh, white and Latino community. That's true. Okay. True. And I think that there are black cops in this uh, community over the years that have been brutal themselves, even That's to their true. own wives. So I'm sick and tired of hearing some woman say this is just the African American community. Because if you, if, if, you, if you address the issue of police brutality, most of the victims in this country, she left, of course, Miss Knight or whatever her name is, most of the victims are victims of 
police brutality in this country. Play, play, play. I'm asking up. Let's get to the question of the young lady that came together. Tony, Tony. Tony, let's get the question of this the little guy in the Let's go. Back here in the back. Back here in the back. I would like to know what we can do as citizens to keep the same thing from happening again. Vote. Vote. That's what we get the politicians out of office.
is when the uh, decisions are being made on what they're going to do. I wanted to pick back up on what Jerry said um, and really going back to an earlier comment. I don't think that the solution, and, and I think it's good to hear different points of view, um, I don't think the solution is always changing who's in office. That's too simple an answer. The problems that we've had in Austin have been historical problems. I'm a graduate of Austin High School, and we had problems then. My children, all three of them graduated from the Austin schools, and we've had problems all of these years. It was not the present administration that was there when I was in high school. It was not the present administration that was there when my children were in high school. And you have no guarantee that others are going to do better. We've had a history of not enough community residents pulling together to make the community all that it can be. And if you're determined to change things, people respond to the pressure of what the people in the community want. It's not enough to think that because somebody is in office, they're gonna do the right thing. We have to make them do the right thing. And we do that by putting energy and time to be consistent with our demands. And I'm hoping that out of something that was negative, good things can come and that we will build community so that regardless of where we live in the community, we care one part of the community is hurting and that we rally around it to make it right for everybody. If it's not good on the hill, it, it can't be good in the valley and vice versa and everybody's got to care about it. And you have to be consistent. You have to come out and let them hear your voice of what you want. You want more for our young people? Demand it. Okay, we're going to take a couple more questions from the audience and we have to close out. Suggestion in reference to what Clay Tiffany just said. Okay, it's not about being personal. That must be mm -hmm. on tape. That is a, a, a representation of oppression in Austin from the police force. So if it's on tape, something like that gets part of this. And the government. That's fine. And it's then you just started to say they didn't even see it. That's He's a liar. We're not getting into this. We're, we're not getting into this. 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 That is why, if that's on tape, and these are the types of incidents, that goes to CCR, and it will be Who's addressed. Who's CCR? Who's up there at CCR? The, for, the Center for <laughs> Constitutional Rights. And are they going to do anything? You're damn right. That's why we're all here. No, okay. that's not what, if they're sincere, that's one thing. I see a lot of people in it's this a room, new corner. they're not here for the same it's purposes. It's a new corner. You let go of the negativity. You work towards positive change. What do you mean? We what are, you me what you I'm not telling you what to do. I am trying to, uh, yes, okay, yes. to yes. We are working together as a group, and I want that case. We'll make sure that the group works the whole All right, this is the last question. We don't need that personal discussion. Exactly. And that's and these races and say, you go to our community. Can I ask a question? That's what I'm asking. Clay, 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 hold on, hold on. Uh, I, it was my turn. That's fine. I wanted to know what we could do as a community to maybe suggest that the, the three or five officers in question not patrol just the downtown area um, when they come back to work just so for the safety of everybody. And we, we all here to be concerned about the community. If they're bad cops, they're bad cops all over. I was addressing the bad cops. I was the bad cops. I'm not 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 the bad cops. i um, I guess we could just protest the police department and see if the department. Okay, I think that you can make, you can, and I was actually going to ask the mayor, um, since he's come back in the room, about this. I think that the, the community could put in a request that at, at, at least at this point in time where feelings are running so high, where things are still unresolved, that the officers involved, you know, not be patrolling in the in the downtown area. Patrolling anywhere, not just the downtown. Well, right area. Right. I mean, I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, would you like to? No, I don't want to ask you. Know, you can't just put them up in 
another section. I guess that right now, while all the more answers, I was in that sheet. I just wanted an answer to my question. Everybody has their turn for questions. I don't want to hear from you. Where is he? He doesn't want to make a comment. Could I say one thing? Why is he here? I would just like to say one thing. And that's that I don't agree with something that was said about our elected officials. I feel if you're not doing a job while we put you in the office, then we should get you out of there. And we can't keep saying, well, give him another two years and maybe things will change. When we talk, when we put him in there, we voted to put him in there, things started changing then. And I don't feel like anything will change if we keep him in there, whoever, another two years. Willie Lynch, Willie Lynch, divide and conquer, divide and conquer, Willie Lynch. I have a question for the Center for Constitutional Rights. Does your office have the resources and the technical support? Have you done these cases before? Huh? Yeah. No, 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 the technical support to review the raw forensic evidence? Yeah, we have a lot of experts. We've done a lot of cases like this, and we've seen a lot of these reports. So we do, yeah. Okay, we're going to wrap this up. But anybody who wants to get in contact with any of the organizations, we're going to stay around for a couple minutes, and you can either leave your name and number with us, or we'll give you our name and number so you can be able to reach us. Can you give out phone numbers for the viewing audience? You can contact me at 762-2173. Optic, you can contact Nancy Holbrook, 941-5034. We're just trying to give out some numbers and some stuff before we leave, so we will have a way of contacting people. So if you need us a little patience, Jermaine will let Walter give you some numbers. Also, we have, you can reach FIST at 923-FIST. The phone number is being instated at the end of next week, so that's the number we're going to give out. It's 941-923-FIST. Oh, yeah, we're going to give out the set of constitutional rights. Well, what people do, come through me. My number is 941-6046. And if you have any people that have been brutalized, you can call me at 941-6046, and they get my tape, I'll get right back to them. And then we'll funnel that down to the center. I want to thank everybody for coming on the spur of the moment.